I get to introduce Matt. I'm lucky to do that. Um, it could have been Cheryl, but um, that wouldn't matter. So uh, maybe next time. So um, as some of you might know, Matt is a native New Yorker, grew up in Brooklyn, graduated from Hofstra University in 2012 with a bachelor's degree in psychology. He joined us soon thereafter in our inaugural group at BASP. Um, before he finished even his first year, he had already uh, presented research at last spring's Psych Science Conference. Uh, he has more of it uh, that he's going to present uh, here very soon at SPSP. Um, and along with that, he won a very competitive travel award to get him there. So obviously, he's um, got himself off to a good start, um, especially uh, in accumulating um, what might be the most important unit of knowledge for a social psychologist, and that is completed studies that are done <laughs> and analyzed, and you know enough about them to motivate the next one. And so um, we're really proud of him for that. Um, as some of you might know, uh, Matt's deep and abiding interest, research interest, is in what makes people so stupid? Um, or <laughs> to put it another way, maybe more politely, what is it that, uh, what are the factors that make people resistant to information that goes against what they already believe? And so I think we'll see an example of that in uh, his uh, master's research. And finally, one thing that I wanted to say, um, Cheryl suggested this, and I totally agree with it, but uh, a very special thing about Matt, I think, is his um, passion, his relentless uh, pursuit of improvement, of learning, of knowing more things. He's always seemingly happy, uh, unlike me, <laughs> hear how things could get better even. So um, I just think it's a really neat thing, and so I'm happy to have you here and welcome that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Curtis. That was really nice. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you, Bass faculty, Cheryl, Curtis. It's been a great time working with you over the past two years. So throughout our daily lives, we are constantly met with challenges to our beliefs. For example, when I first, uh, I used to think I was a great writer, and then I started this whole grad school thing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the way people respond to belief-threatening information depends largely on the source and the strength of the evidence. What I plan to convince you of today is that we view such information through a relational lens. Take my relationship with my mother, for example, who's in the audience today. See, my mother's an incredible person. I admire her for her, her work ethic, her care, and just her overall character. But let's just say we don't lie on the same side of the political spectrum. So how am I supposed to respond to such a threat to my beliefs? I could distance myself, I could be more close to her beliefs, perhaps as a way of protecting what I believe, or I could be more open to what she believes as a way of accommodating our relationship. So what determines whether I get more closed or more open? And the answer is relationship closeness. So take this as an example. You know, you know this puppy is not disagreeing with that puppy on uh, core beliefs. My point is exactly this. If people want closeness, then they will open up as a way of accommodating their relationship, whereas if they're avoiding closeness, they will become more closed off as a result of belief differences. So this maps onto something we see in the relationships literature, which is attachment avoidance. People low on this measure tend to seek closeness, so low avoidance, whereas people high on this measure tend to avoid closeness. But if you take a look into the literature, people usually, uh, research usually shows a assimilation effect. When you're with close others, you tend to act more like them, and it activates lots of relationship-relevant constructs. But it was Gabriel and colleagues that integrated this idea of attachment avoidance into this literature. So what they did was, excuse me. What they did was they asked people, think about someone, uh, a really close friend. And they looked to see if attachment avoidance moderated this uh, assimilation effect. So what they found was this. 
People low on avoidance, they show this assimilation effect. When they think of people that are close to them, they rate themselves as more similar to that person. Whereas they found with high avoidance, when they thought of someone close to them, they shift their self-concept away. So how does this relate to my relationship with my mother or how people respond to differences in beliefs? This is where my research comes in. So if I, if I want closeness, then I should be more open. If I'm avoiding closeness, then I should be less open. So you might be able to see this in, uh, as the self is really dynamic. So when I'm with my mother, I'm more like her, whereas when I'm with my liberal friend, I'm more like him or her. So this brings, uh, this brings us to experiment one. When do unshared beliefs make people more open? So we started by doing a relationship manipulation. We told our participants, think of someone uh, very close to you, and we manipulated who they were thinking of. So we told them, think of someone close to you who either shares your religious beliefs, doesn't share your religious beliefs, or a control condition for comparison. So we told them, think about the most positive aspects of your relationship. This is a way of inducing this like affiliative motivation, this desire to be close with the person. And we, we wanted to see how this, these differences in beliefs would make people shift their openness to evidence. We used religiosity because it's a particularly relational construct. People tend to share religiosity with close others. And um, it's, uh, we wanted to see if this was sensitive to this attachment motivation. So then we showed them really strong evolution evidence right after we told them to think of someone close to them. So at the top of each page, there were four pages, was a criticism of evolution. So here's one. Evolution is only a theory. It is not a, science, it's not a fact or a scientific law. And then after that was a really strong scientific rebuttal. So this is meant to induce this belief threat, these differences in beliefs. And then we assess their openness with three items. We, so, for example, to what extent would you like us to recommend further information on evolution? And then we assess their religiosity. We use this as a proxy for, uh, uh, for this disagreement with evolution. So people high on this in the literature, they tend to show defensiveness to evolution, and they tend to be against it. And attachment avoidance. This is what we expected to moderate this effect. So it took on this format. So we start with the relationship prime, then we show them the evolution evidence, openness ratings, and then our primary measures. So we found some interesting results. First, let me describe the graph to you. We have religiosity on the x-axis. So people high on this, we generally, don't try and interpret it yet. <laughs> people high on this, on this try, uh, tend to be against evolution. So as you expect, we have openness on the y-axis. So people high on religiosity tend to be low on openness to evolution, as you'd expect. So first, let me call your attention to the control condition. First, uh, so for the shared conditions, they were not significantly different from the controls. So I'm going to speak, to, speak to, uh, about them as the same, although I am interested in the variability. So first, if we look at the low avoidance, recall that these people don't, uh, they, they seek closeness, they want it. So if, if we, uh, so people high on religiosity, we, we see this trend towards uh, being against or not as open to evolution. But interestingly, we have a flat line for high avoidance. I've, I've done several studies in this area by now, and it's difficult to find a flat line between religiosity and openness to evolution. So this is beginning to unfold the picture about um, how high avoidance people, they might not be as inclined to be defensive against their beliefs because they don't really want closeness with those they share the beliefs with. But the interesting part, what I was particularly interested in with this study, was the unshared condition, where beliefs are different. Back to the original example. So if we look at the difference between the control and the avoidance, the, uh, as expected, the low avoidance people, recall again, they want closeness, so they shifted their openness towards the unshared person. They became more open as a result. Whereas the high avoidance people, they became less open. They have this distancing kind of effect. This maps on to Gabriel and colleagues. So if we wrap up uh, experiment one, we, have, we find that avoided people become less open, but non-avoided people become more open. So this brings us to experiment two. 
So originally, we set out to do a conceptual replication of, of experiment one. But if, if you've been doing research for a while, you know that that doesn't typically go the way you expect. <laughs> so we had a couple differences from study one. First, we used evolution beliefs themselves instead of religiosity. I'm sure that was one of your questions. Uh, so, we, um, so we use evolution beliefs themselves, and we don't need to uh, extrapolate from their religiosity and infer that people that are higher in religiosity are always going to be against evolution. In fact, if you, uh, when I look at the data, there are people who are really high in religiosity and are completely fine with evolution. So we wanted to use evolution itself. Then we changed the manipulation slightly. So the, in study one, we told them write about the most positive aspects of your relationship. We changed this a little bit. We wanted to turn this up a couple notches because we really wanted to nail down the difference between the shared and unshared conditions because we don't know what's happening and we don't know what they're thinking of in the control condition. So we dropped the control condition and we did an anticipated interaction to strengthen this effect. So we told them, so we just told them, think about someone who either shares your, religious, uh, your beliefs on evolution or doesn't share your beliefs on evolution. And then we told them, well, they marked down their initials, answered a couple questions about them. And then we told them, you may be asked to text this person about the information you're about to read. So this was meant to tune them, you know, look at the information through this relational lens. So it took on this format. We asked about their evolution beliefs then the shared unshared relationship manipulation, this anticipated interaction, and then the evolution evidence and openness ratings. So as you might find, the results are a bit different. So first, let me just point out, now we have evolution on the x-axis. So people low on this are against evolution. They think the evidence is weak. They don't think it's true. So now we have these, these positive sloping lines. And the only difference we find is here. In the high avoidance, now they become more open as a result, whereas in study one, it was the low avoidance people who became more open. So I have a couple reasons for why I think that is. Perhaps we could spend some of the social hour on that. Uh, so here was the difference. So we have both effects from study one and two. We have avoidant people became less open as a result of thinking of someone who has different beliefs whereas non-avoidant became more open. This maps on really well into our theoretical framework. This is based on this desire for closeness, makes people shift around how open they are to evidence. Whereas in study two, now the avoidant people became more open, and for non-avoidant, we saw that there was no change. So I have a couple of reasons for why this might be. So in study one, we had this positive prime, whereas in study two, we had an anticipated interaction. So if we... If we assume from a philosophy of science standpoint, if we assume that the effects we have uh, are what they are, like we're, we're trusting that they're legitimate effects, then we have to assume that the difference is because of the manipulation, because that was the main difference. One of them we could have, that one of them I had already explored was the changing from religiosity to evolution, but when we checked it, it mapped directly onto evolution beliefs, so that wasn't a plausible reason. So if, if there's uh, something driving this, then it must be this anticipated interaction versus this positive prime. Perhaps it's because uh, anticipated interaction makes this more salient, how the threat could be salient, whereas it's, it's among a different kind of effect when you do something like a relationship affirmation. That's kind of what the positive prime was more like. So the implications of this research, it shows the importance of diversity. Uh, if, Whenever someone became more open to the evidence, it was when they were thinking of someone close to them who they don't share their beliefs with. Perhaps our differences make us realize that we're not always right. And next is the relationships, uh, how relationships and the spread of ideas. So if, if we want to, if social psychology has taught us anything, it's that we care deeply about what other people think. If we want to learn about people as individuals, it's important for us to learn about the people they care about. Thank you. Yeah. In your study too, so the high avoided people, they are actually, they, they don't believe in evolution. And then they, be, when they are, when you anticipate the interaction, they become uh, 
they become more open to evolution beliefs because people are close to them believe in evolution, right? Yeah, so uh, exactly. So people who are low on this measure, these are, this is where you usually will see the action because these are people who are against it. We don't typically find differences where there are, you, when you're thinking of something you already believe, it kind of doesn't move you around as much. At least that's what we expected. Okay. So yeah, now we find that that is the shift. So in that, in that study too, is, would it that be a moderating effect that uh, there's a stigma attached to people who don't believe in evolution? And I hear you talking, mm -hmm. by the way, I don't really believe that much in evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, people might want to, to avoid that, that stigma. Perhaps. Like, like the people might think the people are close to them might think they yeah. are dumb because you, you yourself Certainly. talk about it as evidence. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say whether they actually believe that, you know, whether they're changing their beliefs. I would, I would bet that it's more of this uh, like slight shifting as a way of avoiding conflict, perhaps. But um, I don't believe I've gotten deep enough to start getting at what's the underlying drive for that. Uh, there is some stuff in the social tuning literature that gets at this that people want to get along. So they, they want to shift their values and attitudes towards the person. So that might be particularly the case for people that we really care about. Does that get it? Yeah, the, and also yeah. the moderating effect that they mm -hmm. might want to avoid the, the stigma. Perhaps, yeah. The stigma is more pervasive mm -hmm. because evolution, people who believe in evolution are, are, are the majority. Yep, Darren. Um, I really like the, uh, the paradigm you use it. Um, Thanks. But I think that, like, as maybe like a future study thing, you might want to see, like, instead of doing like anticipated interaction, like an actual interaction, mm -hmm. um, and see if people will accommodate their beliefs um, if they want to, you know, have a smooth interaction with somebody. Yeah. Or if they will show like more. Uh, like negative non-verbal behaviors as a kind of sign of like avoidance of yeah. interacting with that person. And then maybe even um, like in a context where people who have different beliefs have to work towards like a common goal, whether it's oh, yeah. mm -hmm. accommodate their beliefs in order to achieve that goal. Um, and then I really <clears throat> might do a lot with like politics or something like that. Oh, totally. You know, I think this is prime like, time for that. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. I want to think about that. So future. Great. Yeah, thank you. I don't know who to, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is, uh, is avoidance correlated with agreeableness? I'm not sure we didn't measure agreeableness, but that is an interesting way to look at it and think about that. Because um, it will, avoidance is more relationship specific, so it, it's not as general. So agreeableness could be more like, I don't, I just want to like, I just want to agree with you, whereas uh, avoidance is about this desire for closeness. So they, they might not be agreeable or they might not be anti-agreeable but like um so but they're avoiding closeness so um i'm not sure how they map onto each other but that's an interesting point one more question oh sure um yes. it might be related to what you're getting at but i was thinking of for the avoidance does that what, what do we know about avoidance and just the desire for interaction period because that's that's this big difference between the first yeah. and second study right is this anticipation of an actual interaction is that, is that more of an anxiety thing? Is it something yeah. to be avoided in somebody that's high in avoidance? Yeah, that's, that's one of the things I was, uh, that I'm proposing that uh, I'm just going to go back to the, the different findings of the studies. So, um, yeah, I was thinking that um, it might un occur only under times of threat. So people, I've seen some evidence showing that avoiding people respond negatively to positive, like affection and thinking positively. So that could be driving this distancing effect in study one, because we have this, we have them thinking about positive things when they don't really like that stuff. You know, they say, I don't want to share information with my partner, stuff like that. So that could be driving that effect. Whereas now the anticipated interaction, they could just not want a, a problem, you know? so. Where if you look at it like insecure and secure, then, then you'd expect the no change for the non-avoidant, which would make up, a secures would make up a lot, a big portion of that, because they tend to show a stable, positive view. So I'm wondering why, uh, so it could be that when you push them towards this positivity, then they become more open. But um, that, and that's what I'd assume, because the main difference, the only plausible explanation would be this difference in the manipulation. Uh, 